2017, I decided to record an album completely analog, like it was done back in the 70s. I decided to do that because the feeling that comes across in the music is just so much more real. First, I've got to introduce you to somebody. Without this guy, nothing would have happened. I had recorded the tape a bit a long time ago, but never had I done a whole album on tape before, and it had been many years since I'd even heard any tape. When I heard it played back, it was like finding something you had lost as a child and getting it back and realizing you had totally forgotten you even lost it. It was, it was so impactful. I realized all those years of recording digital that there had always been something missing that I couldn't put my finger on. I didn't know what it was because I didn't have enough understanding of the recording process. Uh, but I just always felt, you know, what was being recorded digitally just wasn't exactly what I was doing. It took about a year to find all the equipment and uh, got it all tuned up and ready to go. The studio turned out to be like this little satellite in space could go into and work and create. It was a very noisy neighborhood, but somehow it always worked out that we were able to work around it. Dream Analog was recorded, mixed, and the digital mastered by Brian David Harden. He came to Los Angeles from Nashville, and a bunch of his friends did too. They ended up playing on my record. June Cotto, James Whelan, Rebecca Stout, James, Paula Montando, and Matt Croco also played a bit. I kept looking for horn players. I couldn't find anybody. I mean, I looked, I think I looked for like two years. I finally found Mike Cordoni and Jesse McGinty off of a website, and I sent them the parts. I just sang them, and they came and played them, and I was just blown away. It was amazing. As anyone that works on a project that takes a long time to manifest knows, there are always moments in the process where you feel like you're barely hanging on. But you hang on somehow, and you get to the next chapter, and uh, eventually you get over the hill. It took about four years to find the equipment and get everything recorded and mixed and mastered and made into a record. It was worth it. I was looking for a particular feeling in the mixing studio and Northern California was pulling me, pulling me. So I looked around up there and I found Laughing Tiger Studios. We stopped up at the sequoias on the way and visited one of the biggest, oldest sequoia trees on the planet. It's named General Sherman, but I renamed it Mother Earth Tree. It just goes up and up and up and up and up and up. Oh, Mother Earth. sky in this revolving dark time of mine seems we're set apart Got to Laughing Tiger Studio, uh, Luna, the official greeter, came out and said hello. We had three days to mix 13 songs.
calibrating two track that we're going to mix down to. A little Interesting. Little padding waffles on one side there. Back up of your and it is supposed to go there. Fifteen. And that's fifteen and nine. Why is that much fun? That's weird. We have a bad cord? That's crazy. Okay, yeah, we've had a problem here. Feeling in the room when we thought we had lost one of the tapes was pretty intense, and I got some sage and started walking through the studio. It was definitely not a, a good feeling. Um, so I was like, well, let's just get some sage and walk, do the loop of the studio. And uh, maybe it'll help shift it. We had a few moments where the house was falling down. One of them was when uh, we had mixed the first reel and we went and put the second reel on and it was doing that weird wonky thing where it sounded like it had been demagnetized. What happened was these little, one of these two little pieces right here unwound. There's a little screw in the middle of it and it unwound and it allowed the tape to slide off just a fraction of an inch. Just slid back a fraction of an inch and that put the tape out of alignment. It wasn't making connection with the, with the heads down below here and uh, in the right way it's, it had slid off of its little track and so for 30 minutes it took me to figure out that all it was was scary. screwing this one little screw back on and it was all fine. Yeah, we were going through trying to fix it. I was like, well, it'll just be an EP. ups and downs, some issues, but we worked through it all and we stayed on the horse and we got a record we love. Put 
this album with Terry is probably going to be refreshing for you. It was Hopefully. played. To a, <laughs> nothing was played to a click track. It was all done live. Mm -hmm. She's singing the final vocal while she's playing acoustic guitar while the band is playing live to her one take. We attempted uh, more like the 1970s recordings, all analog. Oh. Well, that's a 16 good. track analog. Yeah. Okay. Oh, was it and 16? Yeah, yeah. Mixed it through an that SSL. Was a good format. Mixed it to a half inch through an yeah. SSL. And so there's the SSL compressor on it. I love this machine. Oh, yeah. yeah. They are good. They, they are the gentlest on tape. The tape never touches anything except the head. There's no lifters. The lifters work differently. Uh, I actually grew up with this. Uh huh. Well, you know, there's something, and I like the, the these are A80 mastering decks. Mm -hmm. You know, they have the preview head if you wanted yeah. to. But we bought a bunch of these years ago. And the thing about this tape deck, though, I don't think you can see uh, that it's been modified. Now, it looks like a regular Studer. But there's something really different about it. it takes 14-inch reels. A80s never did. We need to have 14-inch oh, yeah. reels on a mastering deck. Handles it no problem because it's built to mm -hmm. take even bigger tape. And of course, uh, you have to rebuild the machine every time you change the size yeah. of the tape. But <laughs> Some of the best sounding albums are, are actually from where I got my first job at Contemporary. If you want to hear a really great sound, like Sonny Rollins' Way Out West, mm -hmm. Art Pepper Meets the Rhythm Section, some of these albums are pretty phenomenal. They sound like they're standing right there. Wow. I mean, they're quite impressive. And but they were they were live to two track, probably? Yeah. Wow. It was live to two track with a passive board, mm -hmm. no electronics. Wow. Only the two channels in the tape machine. <laughs> How does that work? It was wow. an eight channel board. It's a special way of mixing. After I left there, they actually uh, uh, put in a uh, solid state board and there was no, it was gone. The energy. It's gone. Wow. Wow. That must have been a sad moment. Well, yeah. I mean, it's unfortunate, but. Uh, yeah. When we finally got the tape machine hooked up, and I sang a song and listened to it. Yeah. I started crying. None of my recordings had ever really captured what I was doing to that same level. Digitals, yeah. they have a sound that is different. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just different. And no matter what you do, because it's got more electronics, more processing, conversions, converting it, converting it to one thing and then converting it back, you're going through all of these processes, it's going to change it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it does. And it does. Do you think uh, okay. the, the Beatles recordings were uh, pretty uh, spectacular because of that same sort of tube mics uh, through the... Well, everybody did it that way. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, and it's not that everything sounded great. You know, there were some guys that didn't know what they were doing or they weren't careful or they were like going machine to machine to overdub, mm -hmm. you know, make a copy and then add something that way. There are all kinds of weird ways of doing things. It's hard for playback cartridges to handle some of these transients and edgy sounds that come in now. So analog, analog, analog is... It's better. Yeah, because it doesn't have such a sharp attack all the time. And that's what's hard to track, you know. Some of these grooves look like square waves. In a playback cartridge, the stylus is barely going to make that. And they are square waves. Well, sometimes they are. I mean, the cutter head will cut a square wave, but uh, but you try to track it. You have a, a lot of times we'll get skipping. It has to be a real deep groove for it to just kind of barely get through there. But it's gonna sound good.
This is what you sound like back backwards That's really what I fast. I sound like on Pluto. They listen to know. music really fast on Pluto. I worked with them for six months, trying all different combinations, different ways, sending them stuff. They would do their codec and. And we, we were the ones that were involved in the MFIT stuff, where the made for iTunes mm -hmm. the format. Mm -hmm. And we have a computer back there that analyzes it. And because we found that their digital compression doesn't work well on these things that are really slammed hard. Mm -hmm. And so we came up with a way of doing it with uh, the, the optimum sampling rate and, and bit rate. They wanted to go 96 because they wanted it as a marketing thing, but it mm -hmm. didn't sound as good. Mm -hmm. So it's all done with listening tests and so forth. We found out that they throw away 70% of the information. <laughs> this is my point. To so make it a small file and you can download it fast. Yeah, but at what price? It's quality. always been that. Yeah, I know. Convenience over quality. And the two little one inch speakers inside your computer are now the reference. <laughs> Our original studio was uh, on Sunset, just around the corner, mm -hmm. next to Ocean Way. Oh, okay. It was, it was in the Ocean Way building. And uh, the rooms were basically like this, except these are three feet longer and three feet wider, but it's the same mm -hmm. ratio. Two-way system. It's just got a one woofer and one tweeter on each side, basically. And it, it but it's a good room. Three, mm -hmm. three more feet of bass trapping back here behind mm -hmm. that scrim. Mm -hmm. There's big wedges coming out of the oh, uh, wow. wall back there so we don't get standing waves and stuff because it's real difficult to control the sound in here. Mm -hmm. And these are even uh, bass traps on the side and they're at, ang at angles and so forth. And, and we even tuned it so that it wouldn't sound like you are got earmuffs on there. Here's soft. Yeah. Okay, and there's air behind there, but these are those... Uh, uh, panels of uh, absorption material, mm -hmm. but the sound can go through these. Mm -hmm. But it was like, it was like, <laughs> well, Earmuffs. It was all that, yeah. it was like, and that's bad, because if, if you do that, you have to play the speakers louder. Mm -hmm. And then you get into the distortion range of the speakers, mm -hmm. and you get ear, you get fatigued. So we, we alternated with hard material, and then back to soft material, and now that's we can sweet. feel like somewhat natural talking to each other. Did you ever know the des a room designer named Tom Hidley? Oh yeah, because oh, it, yeah. Uh, everybody in town knew him at one yeah. time. Because <laughs> he, uh, he built Nashville, all those great rooms. He was he yeah. was doing those. Yeah, he did. Yeah, I never worked in a Hidley room, but they, they were all over LA. That's what I I work in all yeah. the Hidley rooms. Yeah, yeah. they they yeah. sounded nice. They were uh, the wooden monitors were similar to the Westlakes. Mm -hmm. You know the wooden, and they you know they, they, they sound, horns, wooden, yeah horns, yeah. wooden horns. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Tad. Yeah, you know. Yeah, they can. Yeah, they're they're fine. I mean, those things, uh, as long as they're aligned right and so forth, mm -hmm. they, they were good speakers. They were all old fashioned, like these. Mm -hmm. They're compression tweeters, not dome tweeters. Yeah, and and they're they're actually a tighter, a, a more accurate sound, I think. Yeah. And so when you hear like triangles and things like that on these, they sound really clean and clear, but on a lot of dome tweeters, they're messy. Mm -hmm. Messy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it's, but it's not that it has to be really clean. It's just that I like it that way. Yeah. I do too. <laughs> if you put I, I them up we're... side by side, yeah. Alan Sides used to do this all yeah. the time. And we would tweak these ATRs up, uh, the half inch and the quarter inch, and we'd do blindfold tests, switch between them, always pick the quarter inch, always. Wow. The top end is more natural and more effortless. The reason why has to do with the impedance curve of the head, for one thing. The way a tape machine works is that there's a, a head. This is this is a electromagnet in a way, or it's like a, it's a magnet. Mm -hmm. It has a coil around it. it. Has a coil, and you're you're trying to extract the signal off the tape. Now, when you get a transient, the coil has to capture the signal. It has to go through the coil. Now, a coil in electronics acts like an open when, it, when you hit it with a transient. It acts like there's nothing there, which is really odd. So what happens is you hit it with a transient, the coil has a lag time. Well, the half inch head is bigger and it's a bigger coil. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bigger pole piece. Yeah, yeah. As the, as the frequency goes up, the resistance goes up. 
So now we got more and more resistance. We have to have more and more drive to the head mm -hmm. in order to get the frequency response you want. So it takes more power to drive the head when you're recording and so forth. Uh, so, uh, so that's part of the reason. Also, the azimuth is more critical with half inch. It's more forgiving with quarter inch. With, with hmm. half inch, because the pole piece is so, the, the tracks are so wide, hmm. that just the slightest off of the head throws off the, uh, the azimuth so that it's not tracking maybe as well the signal. Hmm. So you have to have a really good machine. The ATRs are good though, they're pretty mm -hmm. steady. But see, if you look at a high frequency on a tape machine, it's usually not perfect. So that quarter inch is a little more forgiving that way. Hmm. The, the, the azimuth can be off a little bit and you don't even hear it. But a, a half inch or a, the one inch mm -hmm. machine that they made is even more critical. You just get it a little bit off and it, you're losing top end. Mm -hmm. So, because uh, of those fast frequencies of high frequencies. So, so in order to keep the integrity all the way down the head, the pole pieces have to be perfect. You know, because because you can even be subtracting some of the signal along the pole piece. So uh, it's 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 all that stuff gets a little more critical. But it is a little quieter. It's a little more durable. You can practically step on it and still play it. <laughs> Whereas the quarter inch, you have to be more careful with it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those old recordings that you love are all quarter inch. Wow. Half inch didn't come in till wow. the, the, until the uh, around the late seventies. Yeah, all of that stuff way back was all quarter inch. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and it was 15. All, almost everything was 15 all through, through the 70s. Yep. Then, then 30 came in in the late 70s as well. Hmm. But, you know, uh, they're, they're both great, you know, but uh, we've, we've, it's just a really interesting thing you should try. It, it's so mysterious, a lot of this stuff, and elusive, you know, to it try is. to understand these things. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, if you are kind of always searching and comparing and trying to find the best of whatever, you start to learn all this stuff about it. Okay, oh, now this is uh, number seven. Seven. Nothing to break that fall. Yeah. Okay. And our time on it is two, uh, 3.41. Okay. This is some wool bottom there I was just bringing out a little bit. It's got some nice low. I just remember where I'm on it. She's sounding great. Yeah, these are all.
Almost the same uh, EQ. 500 hertz. Well, it's it's uh, there's a boost at 500. Yeah. To move her out a little bit, but not bright. I don't want her bright. But I'm 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 keeping it uh, keeping this from resonating. But I'm adding it back up here with some lower bottom. Mm -hmm. So I'm just moving the bottom a little bit down. Yeah. so good. I like how you made yourself an obstacle course, you know. You know it keeps I'm you in shape. Those things over. It, it keeps you, you in know, shape. You know, they, they don't right? make a lot of difference, but yeah. that's the order. That's, my, my shop is in all that stuff. But you know what's interesting? That's another thing. They called me in one day and they had two test cuts. And they said, okay, which one do you like? This one or this one? Of course, I picked one of them sounded better than the other one. And I said, okay, so what did you do? I mean, what? All they changed were these lifters to those back there. There's, back there, there's some darker ones made out of different metals. I mean, wood. See those, what, that dark yeah. wood one? Yeah. That was the only difference. And they made a difference. I could hear the difference in the sound. I won't He's just watching TV when he goes over there. Yeah. yeah. Checking in it's on the game. What's happening here is each color of the four color process is being laid down on the paper. You have black laid down, then cyan ink laid down, then magenta ink laid down, and then yellow. So there is a layering of the color, and that's how the machine creates the image. With four color process printing, the ink is layered on. Yeah. 
I did see it. Yeah, I see it in there. So, I mean, he can darken this side up a little bit if you want to go a little more, take a little yellow. Can, can you? Yeah. Is, that, is that a hard thing to do? Yellow there, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe. If you can, just, if it's possible, it's not a full apple balance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. get in so he can take his measurements. prep it up and clean it, and then we put a coat of silver on it to, to make it conductive. Then after that, we dip it in into the pre-plate tank. Uh, we put them on these hangers, connect it to the rectifier, and put a charge on it. It sits in the tank overnight, and it builds up a coating of nickel onto the, onto the lacquer. We take that take that coating and we separate it off the lacquer. I think we've got some over here that still have the coating on them. Oh, see? wow. Um, see, see, so it has the master on here. And so we'll actually pull off the master off of the lacquer and the lacquer will be used again. After we make the master, we'll take it, we'll treat it, put it in the rotary tank. Mother, you can take it, you can put it on the turntable, you can play it, play it, and we can check check the flaws. But this will make a stamp. Over here, in here what we what we probably have, have in here is a mother. Okay, you um, have to make a stamp. The electrical charge and the baskets have a nickel in them. The negative charge here, a positive charge from the Salt of nickel in the solution and it the onto the other part. So, yeah, it's yeah, like that, right? We do that three times, we make that, also we make the metal, we make the same. And first we'll punch out the hole in the metal, we'll turn the outside edge, and uh, then it, it'll go onto the press. Paper. And they go in, we'll watch it, we'll, we'll follow it. 
then here, this is how long it takes. So it's in there now getting pressed. Well, this one is pressing. Here we go. And you can follow it. There's an A damper and the B damper baking it a little bit. All right, I'm going to trim the edges and we re-grind them. Oh, so, you know, we try to recycle as much as we can. So we have the lacquer that you supply to us and then it goes into our plating department. With three-step processing, we make the master, it's a nickel, and it, it goes back in the nickel tank and it's coated and pulled apart. And we have the mother, which you can play and listen to and we do quality control on. And as long as that passes, then we put it back in and it's coated, it comes up, it makes your stamper. So it's a mirror image, mm, play the mother, but you can't play the stamper. And then your records, the final product. Pictures in here checking centering and they log everything as we go all day long. The centering, they weigh them. Um, they can't listen to the whole thing. But yeah. they do the lead in, the lead out, the spreads. They're also visually checking, so they also, in the, with the microscope, they can look for kissing grooves. If there's a noise, whether mm -hmm. it's something superficial or damage, mm -hmm. that can often be corrected on the mother. I hope this documentary inspires you to explore analog recordings and maybe even record analog. Analog recordings reflect a truer sound, I think. It's unprocessed. It's more authentic. It's more real. What you gonna do with your happy ending? What you gonna do with sunny skies? What you gonna do when the sad part's leaving? What you gonna do when the power on? What you gonna do when your vision's clearing? What you gonna do, read between the lines? What you gonna do when wisdom's raining? What you gonna do when the day